There are nearly 30 James Bond games that have ever released. I seem to have taken a wrong turn. And while some are awesome, others are uh, not that great. A spy disguised as a spider? Frightening. So what if we decided to look at all of them? You see, James, you can't kill me. You'd miss me. I never miss. Okay, there's actually a lot of old, old James Bond games that are pretty surface level, not that deep. So we're gonna go through these really quickly before we dig into like the main Bond games that you typically would associate with when you're thinking of a James Bond video game. All the way back in 1982, there was an unofficial game released called Shaken But Not Stirred. It was a pretty basic text adventure game released for the ZX Spectrum. It essentially pits Bond against Dr. Death and you have to like solve puzzles and anagrams and of course just the way these old school text games worked. Nowadays there's actually not that much documentation of this game specifically so it is kind of interesting that this at least existed even if it wasn't at an official capacity. In 1983 though Parker Brothers had the official license to the James Bond IP so they were gonna go all out with some uh, video games here but the first official Bond game was James Bond 007 for the Atari 2600 but it also released on the 5200, the Commodore 64, and ColecoVision. I mean, what can you say about gameplay that, uh, that looks like this? The music is interesting, to say the least. And there are four levels to this game that are all based on different Bond movies. We have Diamonds Are Forever, The Spy Who Loved Me, Moonraker, and For Your Eyes Only. That's a 10 years of Bond here with an interesting soundtrack and these scuba men. I decided to actually play this game because you can play these games very easily on like your internet browser without having to, you know, go dig up an Atari 2600 and a copy of James Bond 007. I swear if this gets me sued. And uh, I struggled to get any points on the board. I uh, avoided the giant hole in the ground and shot at stuff. Eventually, I did get 50 points, and uh, that 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 was that was enough. Uh, James Bond 007 for a lifetime. I mean, it probably was really fun back in the day. Nowadays, you know. 1985, A View to a Kill released, and honestly, this is probably the best Bond game we've seen so far. Even if the whole like shooting animation looks like a nightmare. This game was kind of divided into three separate game modes, so the gameplay experience was supposed to be like differentiated, and uh, for a Commodore 64 game, it looks better than the last Bond games. There also was another release of A View to a Kill, which was a unrelated, full-on text adventure game, kind of like that unofficially licensed game, and that also released the same year. 1987, we saw The Living Daylights, and this game was actually a run and gun game so we're kind of starting to see something different and that was likely a result of the poorly received a view to a kill but hey here we are okay at the very least at this point it's starting to look like a real game and that is definitely progress. I mean, Bond walks around a little bit funny, but we can see Bond and we know that it's actually him, so that's something. 1987 brought us the release of License to Kill, and this game released on multiple different platforms, like a lot. It was on the Amiga, the Amstrad CPC, Atari ST, BBC Micro, Commodore 64, DOS, MSX, ZX, Spectrum, and it later saw releases on the Sega Master System. And all right, this was the first game that actually kind of was somewhat really fun to play surprisingly. The music goes really really hard and I gotta give them credit because Bond nowadays is known for its music especially in video games because remember GoldenEye's music slapped. So this game as a predecessor it did a good job translating the music from the film into a game form. The gameplay itself, it's kind of just like a typical top-down shooter. We've all played games like this before if you've played retro games, and it's fine. At least you kind of feel like you're experiencing scenes from the film, so that's more than what some of the other games a couple of years before it could say. The next one was, in 1990, The Spy Who Loved Me, which is based on the 1977 film. This game was pretty similar to the previous game. It's good enough. There are interesting moments and different scenarios and shooting scenes. There's like a whole launch code 
section, which I thought was interesting, and the illustrations on it are actually really good. Uh, reviewers of this game back in the day called it a competent movie adaptation. Hey, competent. What a, what a, what a goal to strive for. And then finally, in 1992, we saw the release to James Bond 007, The Duel, which came out on Sega Mega Drive, or Genesis, and the Master System video game consoles. Oh, it also came out on the Game Gear. We get to see Timothy Dalton one last time, four years after the last film he was ever in. And this game's interesting. Like, it kind of looks decent quality here, and it also is not directly based on any specific movie or story. It has a completely original story, though they did reuse familiar villains from Bond movies, so we see like Jaws and Oddjob show up, but I do have to say, visually speaking, this game is pretty incredible. It's a side-scrolling shooter adventure game. I mean, it's pretty obvious that this game is inspired by games like Metroid and maybe Sonic the Hedgehog even? I mean, look at this boss fight here. I mean, I'm pretty sure this game's really hard, but nonetheless, I do think this is probably one of the best looking early year Bond game that we've seen. Also, a side note before we go too far into things, there was another game called Operation Stealth that released in Europe, and it had nothing to do with James Bond. However, when the game was released in the US, they decided to use the James Bond tag to try to sell more copies, so the game was released as James Bond 007 The Stealth Affair, and it follows a story of like a CIA agent, but then they changed it to be James Bond and MI6. I don't think this one should fully count, but it is worth at least mentioning here. Okay, then I don't know if the world's ready for this, but there was a James Bond Jr. video game, and this ends up being a whole different rabbit hole. Essentially, James Bond Jr. was like mostly a animated cartoon series in the early 90s following, I think, James Bond's nephew, James Bond Jr. It was written for kids, but man, looking at it, I can't help but to absolutely hate this. But I know there's people out there who are nostalgic for it, so I totally respect it, but me not knowing that this existed until doing research for this video, Oh, man, it changes my entire perspective on the Bond universe. That being said, there were comic books, toys, everything for this, including a video game. All right, so the intro to James Bond Jr. sounds like this. <laughs> This is what the music in the game sounds like. This is like the worst sounding music I've ever heard in a video game. Like, I'm actually upset about it. I don't know, this was probably just a quick cash grab. They did this weird, clunky, side-scrolling adventure game. This is the Super Nintendo, and this is very unimpressive for Super Nintendo years. I mean, the Super Nintendo gave us great looking games like the Donkey Kong Country series, and here we are with James Bond Jr. We get to be that kid stuck playing this. I can't handle this one anymore. So I think it's time we talk about what many fans consider the GOAT, GoldenEye 007. But after all of that, it brings us to GoldenEye, which honestly, as a kid, was my absolute favorite game. I probably was way too young to play this game, but with two older brothers, I was able to kind of sneak on the N64 every once in a while. This game was just incredible. The atmosphere of a lot of the locations with the music made it genuinely feel like an adventure in an interesting first-person perspective. And man, did Rare, the company that developed this game, do such a great job at taking specific locations from the movies and translating translating them into a game level that then would be expanded upon so you could go and explore it. Development on this game actually started in 1995, a few months before the release of the movie itself, so the release of GoldenEye wouldn't be until a good two years after the movie had already released. What's even funnier is that the expectations for this game were really low. The fact that the movie had already been out for a while, and there was kind of this failed presentation at E3 that year, nobody was expecting much from GoldenEye, except the game 
game came out and was incredible. This game was a really unique console experience. There had been first person shooters on PC like Doom and Quake, and there was also games like Virtua Cop that were at arcades. And this game took inspiration from those games and consolidated things into this spy experience only available on the N64. Okay, now obviously GoldenEye was known for being a massive hit, especially with its multiplayer, which utilized all four slots on the Nintendo 64, and the multiplayer was really, really popular back in the day. But the single player itself was heavily praised as well, and it was kind of awesome. There were 18 main levels based on the film itself, GoldenEye, plus two bonus levels that were just kind of based off of other Bond films beforehand. The very first level in this game, Dam, is a great example of how they took a small moment from the movie and turned it into an entire level. In the movie, you get Bond running and then he bungee jumps. In this game, you kind of have to infiltrate this dam area, make your way past enemies, stop some alarms from going off potentially, sneak behind this truck as a kid I always wanted to ride in the back of the truck but I guess that's not an option and then the level ends the same way it does in the first few moments of the movie you bungee jump off and the level's over now the plot of GoldenEye was relatively simple essentially James Bond has to face off against a former MI6 agent known as Alec Trevelyan he wants to use a satellite weapon called GoldenEye to cause a global financial meltdown Bond then meets this like Russian computer nerd Natalia and they stop Trevelyan together they have to like fight this assassin Xenia on a top and you know typical James Bond stuff. Now this game still was kind of in the primitive years of the Nintendo 64, so there was barely any voice acting or anything like that, but there was like a narrative you could follow through the text in the folders before a level started. The game does such a great job at recreating a lot of the set pieces, you don't really need to overthink the story too much, and there is of course like little lines of dialogue that pop up on the screen. The second level, Facility, has you sneaking around this base, you meet up with 006, you plant some mines just like in the movie, and then of course 006 is seemingly killed, but we know he comes back as the bad guy later. You gotta make the big escape on the level Runaway, and while in the movie, you know, Bond like dives after an airplane, this one we just have to get to the airplane, but still, you know, they took these different little locations and expanded them out into multiple levels. Then there's levels like Surface and Bunker, which were just set pieces in the movie used to show where Natalia was working, but now we have Bond missions over in these locations. You gotta go like run through the snow, sneak in, you know, do some stuff and then leave. There's also some levels that were mostly original that were just inserted in between to kind of fluff out some more action during the exposition parts of the movie where there wouldn't be as much action. So we get levels like Silo, where we have to go through this nuclear base or something, or Frigate, which was probably a replacement to the boat part of the movie, but instead we have to free some hostages and track a helicopter. Then we go back to the surface level that has the big satellite dish, but it's, you know, some time has passed, so the sun's setting here. You end up getting captured, and you're a prisoner, and that's where you meet Natalia, and this level level was really hard for me as a kid, but also a really cool concept because all of a sudden your weapons are taken away and you have to kind of think on your feet and kind of approach this level differently than any of the other levels. Keep Natalia alive while also navigating some cameras that are constantly surveying you. And the music is just, oh my god, it's so good. The music in this whole game is fantastic, but just each level has just a vibe. I don't know how they did it. And then the start menu, just hit the start menu for a second. still holds up. Okay, the level statue was always confusing for me as a kid. You gotta like walk around these statues, find Valentine to talk to, Valentine, whatever his name is. Then it's the big reveal, 006 is alive. What? But we're not supposed to shoot him or we fail the level? I I didn't know, I didn't couldn't read as a kid. The rest of the game plays out very similarly to kind of how the movie is as far as set pieces are concerned. After the part where you get captured at the statue, you're then like in this like little like police station base, military base, and you have to escape by finding Finding Natalia, hoping she doesn't run up into the attic, and then jump out some windows, just like the movie. There's even a tank level, just like in the movie, where you get to drive a tank and just run people over and shoot stuff. It's awesome. We make our way through the train depot and actually get on the train, which now we have to go and save Natalia yet again. And of course, this part was always kind of uh, stressful. You have to quickly laser all of these metal plates to open the hatch to escape this train that has a bomb on it, and hope that Natalia runs far enough away from the train or you fail the level. Then 
we get to the jungle and we have to run through the jungle. There's kind of a little bit of a cool boss fight at the end of this, which was not really something first person shooter games on consoles ever had. Then we get to this other set piece turned into a level, which is essentially Boris's role in the movie, but it's like a command center area. Then there was another completely original level in the form of caverns. It's a, a cave level bringing us to Cradle, the big epic climax, which this level has completely different mechanics and roles than any of the other levels. You have to chase after 006 and he's like running up and down and he stops to take breaks to shoot at you and you have to like get your shots in at the right times to weaken him and try to limit how many laps you have to do so you can survive because there's not a lot of health. But if you can stop him and take him out at the final little platform, you escape on helicopter. And if you fail at this, you fall off the platform. <laughs> what an incredible game. But wait, there's more. You finish the game on harder difficulties. There was two bonus levels. There was an Aztec level, which was inspired by the James Bond movie Moonraker, and you have to fight against Jaws. And then there was this other level that took inspiration from a couple of different Bond movies. It had the golden gun. You had to kill Baron Samedi. I think this location is from The Spy Who Loved Me. Crazy single player experience. It was awesome. And then there's so much more. There was multiplayer mode, which was incredible. Once again, utilizing four player split screen and not having to buy an adapter like PlayStation required for four player type gameplay was really big. It just made this game way more accessible and it was just the first time that console players really got to experience like the buzz and hype around first person shooter games in a competitive sense. There was also cheat codes you could unlock that could make things really goofy like DK mode where everyone has really big heads and big arms which I played that mode quite a bit as a kid. There was paintball and a few other things that were pretty fun. This game was just a solid experience and set the bar for Bond games and media moving forward. So what happened next? MGM holding the rights to James Bond was kind of a big deal because yeah, they licensed the movie GoldenEye to Rare, but with the success that Rare was, now they could choose to license Bond into the future to whoever was willing to pay the most money for access to the license. There was no way that Rare would be able to afford the license to James Bond. They were quickly out bid. So Rare would go off to do their own thing and make the perfect dark game that I still love, which was a true sequel to GoldenEye, which plays a role later on because they tried some sequel things to the success of GoldenEye that I don't think worked out as well as maybe they wanted. Nonetheless, EA ended up being the studio to swoop in and gain the rights to Bond. And while EA would begin development, working on a first person follow-up game to the success that GoldenEye was that would release on Nintendo 64, a little side quest happened to make a Bond game based on Tomorrow Never Dies, the new James Bond movie at the time, for PlayStation players who didn't have a big AAA Bond game just yet. Tomorrow Never Dies is a game I'm very conflicted with. On one hand, the nostalgia of this game tied to the movie gets me really excited. Just seeing all this together, it's fun. And I know a lot of people probably spent days and days as kids playing this game and uh, experiencing it, but it's really not that polished of an experience. This game originally was actually supposed to be a sequel to the movie Tomorrow Never Dies. It wasn't supposed to be its own recreation of the film. It was going to be a follow-up thing that was completely its own, which is unique, but they definitely changed their mind there. This game ended up not even releasing close to the release of the movie Tomorrow Never Dies, which doesn't really surprise me considering Goldeneye released so late, but it actually almost released to coincide with the next Pierce Bronson James Bond movie, The World Is Not Enough. So yeah, while that movie was coming out, people could go and buy Tomorrow Never Dies for the PlayStation 1. Now this game took a very different approach from GoldenEye. It was a third person game, but when you aim, you have to go into first person, which right away made the game feel really clunky. Now, I do have to say, the music was kind of a banger in this game as well. But trying to navigate now through this game is, uh, it's uh, kind of yikes. This first level has you kind of sneaking around a bit, you use a sniper, and then there's a snowboarding section? Let's go? What is going on here? Okay, they're gonna sprinkle some cool action moments. I will check this out some more. The second level has some more clunky gunfighting or whatever, and then we're in a fighter jet, and we're just shooting enemies in a fighter jet on the ground. Okay, this is kind of badass. It's not fully polished, but it is badass. Okay, level three, we're in some, I don't know, futuristic nightclub or something. The setting is cool, and this is a nice change of pace compared to the first two levels, a little more action oriented a bit, but the cutscenes are a little bit goofy. I wondered what it would feel like if I ever saw you again. Ah. Now I know. Level four takes us to a 
What is going on here? A giant paper press level. I mean, these death animations are neat. It took me until level five on the Hotel Atlantic level, a level where you're in a giant hotel, to realize that James Bond has like a different outfit for each level, which is kind of a cool touch. Level six, we're in a driving level? Okay, you know what? The controls aren't that great here, but I'm gonna give it a pass because I think the variety of having a driving level at this point in the game after, you know, how this game plays so far is a nice breath of fresh air. Okay, then all of a sudden we're skiing in Japan, okay? Then we have a stealth section. I still hate this first person mode that's weirdly married to third person movement. And then from there, the last three levels are more narrow and linear experiences where you're just like fighting your way through things, having to go and activate little parts to progress the level. And then you'll have like a big standoff at the end. What was this game even about or movie? I guess Tomorrow Never Dies has James Bond going against some like big media mogul known as Elliot Carver. And he wants to manipulate global events to boost his media empire's ratings and profits. And then he wants to like start a war between China and the UK and selling exclusive broadcasting rights to the conflict. This is such a crazy idea. What is going on here? Bond gets roped into the middle of all of it. And yeah, the last couple of levels are you trying to go through and stop this big war that could potentially happen. You fight the last level. It's a little bit challenging. You make your escape. And uh, that's about it for this game. This game also had no multiplayer, which was very surprising considering how massively popular GoldenEye's multiplayer was. Apparently there were plans for a multiplayer experience, but due to the game already being on a tight deadline to try to release before the next movie came out, multiplayer, I guess, just wasn't in the cards to be something that would happen and would have to wait until The World Is Not Enough finally released. So after this, it seems like things are stepping up with Bond releases where maybe they're going to start being more of a yearly thing. The next year we would see the release of The World Is Not Enough, which released on both the Nintendo 64 and the PlayStation 1. But I have to point this out, both games are quite a bit different. I think they're in completely different engines and were developed maybe by different teams or simultaneously. It's always interesting looking at these games side by side. For majority of this video, I played the Nintendo 64 version. However, we did take a look at the PlayStation version, so we'll talk about both versions a bit. This story is a little confusing. There's a lot of moving pieces, but I was entertained trying to follow it in the video game form. Essentially, there's this woman, her name is Electra. She is like the heir to this oil type tycoon who you were supposed to protect at the beginning of the game. You'll see what happens in a minute. But there's this big bad guy who uh, survived an MI6 assassination attempt and he's like bitter towards MI6. He has a bullet lodged in his head that cuts off his nerves so it makes him essentially not feel things and makes him stronger I guess. But apparently he's inevitably going to die but now he has nothing to lose and he's Angie. He's gonna cause a ruckus because you know villain stuff. The first level of this game always really really confused me. You start this level off and you can't progress because you don't have an appointment. Fortunately enough, if you go to the safety deposit box, you have an appointment card and a gun, which is great until you go back to the security guy and uh, he takes away your gun that you just got, but he does let you in because you had an appointment card. Some top level security here. Then there's this cutscene that results in this random gunfight. You still threaten me, even without your weapon. Okay, I got lost in this level all the time. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. I'm running around, I'm opening up doors. I finally figure out this keypad to get some money that I'm supposed to leave with. And I gotta make my big escape. But as you get to the lobby to make your way out, some security guards will run after you that aren't the same as the bad guys you're fighting upstairs. And you're supposed to just know you're not supposed to kill these guys. You're supposed to use your stun gun and just know that. As a kid, I never knew that. I'd always fail this level here. You make your escape and you keep moving on. You're supposed to chase after some assassin, probably this woman from that cutscene. The next level is called King's Ransom, and I gotta say, this game gets hated on by a lot of the James Bond community. People did not like The World Is Not Enough on the Nintendo 64, but as a kid, I was always really impressed by this game because it was a big technological leap from Goldeneye. There's full voice acting here, and the level detail is pretty much a lot better than what we had on Goldeneye, at least comparatively directly. Maybe the level design isn't as smooth and the objectives aren't always as clear, but it is a start to point out that there is something here. The next level is interesting. MI6 gets attacked and it's this big deal. All this hell is breaking loose and you have to go and use your clearance to put things into lockdown and turn on the sprinklers. I guess they have such a high security clearance that if you want to turn on the sprinklers in the case of a fire, you have to be like at a special level. So a lot of these people just can't do stuff. But fortunately, I'm James Bond and I can turn on the sprinklers. This level's easy 
easy to get lost and it is very easy to shoot a good guy that you're not supposed to shoot and fail the level. I may have failed the level a couple of times. By level three, man, things are just going on. There's this huge boat chase scene and oh my god, that boat crash was intense. You're making your way through these like docks and stuff. I accidentally killed a hostage, so I had to start the whole level over again. Later in this level, there's this stupid part where you're supposed to grapple hook and the button combination you're supposed to press to access the grapple hook in your watch is very confusing and I had to look up a guide to figure out what two buttons I was supposed to press to change the mode on my watch. It was uh, kind of annoying. There's also this weird jump motion that's mapped to the C buttons up and you have to do some parkour on some boxes. But I do like the way that this cutscene ends. Hold on sir, this area is sealed off. We have a hostage situation. I'm with MI6, let me through. Like, Bond just doesn't identify himself or anything. He's just like, ah, nah, nah. listen, I'm MI6, trust me, bro. Okay, level four, we're in the subway. We have to go and defuse a bomb and we killed a hostage. Okay, let's try this again. You have to push your way through this subway and when you get to this part where the train is, the train comes like every three seconds. It is the most frequent train I have ever seen in my entire life and it doesn't stop for anybody. Be careful not to get killed. You have to kind of sneak past the train and hide in these corners to get around it. And then you have to defuse a bomb. It shouldn't be too hard, right? I, uh... Uh, I failed and it gives you this cutscene of everything exploding. Okay, second try. I defused the bomb. It's going well. Now all I have to do is chase after this assassin. She's in a hot air balloon making a getaway for some reason, so I climb up the rope in this cutscene. And uh, yeah, we beat the level. Okay, level five is this skiing level, which is interesting. You kind of have some control over which way you're going. It is in first person and you do have to shoot and you're supposed to shoot these towers, which are easy to miss. So uh, that's not fun if you mess that up and have to start all over. Now up until this point, the PlayStation 1 version of the game is quite a bit different. Uh, the whole game, a little bit different. Like for instance, there's no subway train level like we just did on the N64 version, and it doesn't have a skiing section. You just walk through some snow here, but it does have this cool like casino card game section that's not in the Nintendo 64 version. And back on the N64 version, the next level is kind of a stealth level, which is a breath of fresh air after, you know, the high octane skiing we just had to do. On level seven, stuff hits the fan again, and it's, you know, a lot going on keeping up with the plot of the movie itself but I did get to live out my childhood dream of riding in the back of a truck so uh, how much can I really complain here I'll be honest though the next couple of levels as we reach the end climax of the game are not really that good they're very linear very repetitive and they're just not as unique as the first couple of levels at least those were varied and there was different challenges and things going on there's this level where we come face to face with a villain and um, a bunch of rolling ensues <laughs> I don't know how else to describe this. Level 10 has you on some rooftops, which is actually a really cool set piece for a Nintendo 64 game. But then you get to level 11 and there's this big dramatic opening to the scene. There's a lot of confusion and then this poisonous gas that would totally kill you if you don't know exactly what you're supposed to do. So uh, you've been warned, you're gonna have to redo this level a couple of times until you figure it out. You gotta know your button layouts and controls. Oh, what? M is in prison? We're gonna save her. Okay, this is big. And that girl who totally was supposed to be a good guy, heir to the oil tycoon's throne, is a bad guy? Working with the other bad guy? This is bad. You have to do a fist fight, boss fight, with one of her security guards who has a gun. Uh, so you just gotta like kind of punch away and hope for the best. In the last couple of levels, you go to the submarine from the movie and there's a lot going on here. There's water, there's enemies, there's a reactor meltdown, and a big grand escape at the end. This game is crazy. Over on the PlayStation version, the second half of the game, we do see some differences. Uh, one of those really boring levels I played had a cool rocket level where you shoot this rocket launcher at a helicopter with blades on it. Even that boss fight with the fists was way cooler on the PlayStation version, even if graphically the N64 version looked maybe better. And you know what? After playing through the story here, I would say this game holds up better than I thought it did. It's not perfect. It's maybe not like golden eye level of revolutionary, but for what it aimed to to be like a follow-up game experience that a player who enjoyed GoldenEye could expect to get a follow-up type experience on, it was pretty good. Maybe it was outclassed or outshined by how polished and perfect Perfect Dark was that also released around the same time, but I don't know if this game deserves all of the hate that it got. It also had a multiplayer mode that was pretty popular back in the day. Maybe the maps weren't as iconic as the GoldenEye ones, but at the end of the day, I don't think this game was really a full-on 
on, you know, fail. Maybe the levels weren't as fun, but still, it was okay. James Bond looks like he might have like a tumor in his face, but uh, that's really my only complaint. Otherwise, um, I was pleasantly surprised here. Also during this time, EA was trying to make the Bond game series a yearly franchise. So a year later, in 2000, 007 Racing was released. This game used a modified version of the Need for Speed engine and was overall kind of a mixed bag. For a racing game, it feels okay to drive even by PS1 standards, but the level design and objectives of much of this game feel kind of bland. There are a few cool levels, but I can see why this game was mostly panned by critics when there were better driving games out there like Driver for example. Doug Perry of IGN scored the game a 5 out of 10 and stated, EA's 007 Racing is a decent little game, as long as you don't expect too much from it. As you might have suspected, 007 Racing ain't the Sean Connery of Bond games, it's a Timothy Dalton version. It's not original, nor is it good looking. Which kind of is insulting to Timothy Dalton, he wasn't all that bad, come on. There's some interesting cars in the game and there's cool gadgets and of course having split screen is a huge plus because back in the day that's just how you would play these racing games mostly from my own experience, I would just have friends over and then play racing games all day. Now the next game in the Bond series was a really big deal because this was a jump to a new generation and actually this new game, 007 Agent Under Fire, actually started out as the world is not enough but for the next generation of consoles. Yeah, EA was working on a PS2 and PC version of the game overhauling the engine to make a version of the game that would look a lot better, but since this game was taking longer, it ultimately was scrapped, though assets that were made for the newer version of The World Is Not Enough were reused for Agent Under Fire. If you look closely, you'll notice that some of the characters resemble heavily the main villains from The World Is Not Enough, but, you know, they were altered a little bit for this game. Agent Under Fire is an interesting game. The main story of the game is there's this like super secret powerful experimental weapon known as the omen device and there's some bad guy named malprave who wants to use it you know villain stuff so it's up to bond to travel all over save people do some spying stuff and whatnot to stop this device from being misused okay i gotta say this game often is remembered for kind of having mid to mediocre reviews it wasn't ever like panned badly across the board but it kind of is one of the more forgettable bond games and looking back at this game i understand why but i also think that maybe this game is kind of misjudged a bit and this game was probably better than some other Bond games that we've had. Now firstly for 2001 standards this game is a massive technological leap and also was one of the first Bonds to introduce a completely unique story which was kind of awesome. This game has you go through 12 different levels all while a story plays out in the form of cutscenes and whatnot and the first level Trouble in Paradise was kind of an interesting choice. It seems like one of those levels in a game you would see towards Towards the end of a story rather than the beginning, but for the most part it's fine. It's a little bit boring, I'll be honest. However, I am still very impressed by visuals for a 2001 game. Mind you, 2001 saw the releases of games like Halo Combat Evolved, and this game, also being a first person shooter, looks quite a bit better than what Halo Combat Evolved looked when you look at like the smaller details. I just don't want to like gloss over how good looking this game was for its time. The first level has you like infiltrate a secret base, you have to go save this other agent, it's a whole Thing. I remember getting stuck on this level as a kid, never figuring out how to beat it, but now it, you know, we can we can look up guides and stuff and figure things out. But with the first level being a little bit slower paced than maybe what an average Bond fan would like to see, the next level steps things up. It's literally an on-rail shooter, like you're riding in a car, shooting through Chinatown, I think. This is pretty revolutionary for the Bond series and something that was actually not the worst experience. Right after that, we're thrown into a driving level ourselves, so now we're actually behind the wheel. And this game is starting to feel like a hybrid game where it's more than just a standard shooter with a few gimmicks here and there. There's actually some different level design across each individual part of the story. Now you guys gotta remember, when this game came out, I was maybe six or seven years old, and I vividly have this memory ingrained in my brain from when I was young watching my brother play through the game, and on the next level, which is mostly a spy sneaking around type level, there's this cutscene that plays out where Bond like turns a chair to reveal that this guy is dead. I don't know what it was. That just scared me so much as a kid. Like, I just couldn't comprehend it. It just freaked me out. And I didn't even know what Bond game this was from. I thought it was an earlier game, actually, in my memory. But now, looking back and playing these games, yeah, I very much so remember this. And I remember being terrified of this. As far as the story's concerned, I don't really know what's going on. It wasn't really that important. But then, wait, there's a twist. It's a clone or something. Yeah, I think the Omen device has something to do with, like, being able to clone people to make them look like 
like people in power. Also, we need to note here, uh, Bond does not look like Bond. I, I don't know. I mean, this is very much based off of the Pierce Brosnan Bond. There were plans to bring Roger Moore back, but those ended up falling through. And I guess maybe they wanted to do their own type of Bond here. So they pick like a neutral thing that still looked like Pierce Brosnan, but it just feels very, very out of place watching these cutscenes. I mean, listen to this. I'm afraid your interview with Ms. Malprave has been delayed. In the meantime, you can enjoy the view. I already am. The next level is one of those levels where you just go through and blow stuff up and shoot and be as loud as you want. Uh, th that's nice. You do have to open up some doors in typical Bond fashion, but yeah, not too much of a difficult level. Okay, so Night of the Jackal is the next level where you're like in this like structure looking thing. I mean, you start outside, then you infiltrate in, but this level was really weird to me. I feel like this was supposed to be a big stealth level and just the way that the level is set up, it immediately turns into just another one of those like shoot through levels. So I feel like they didn't really nail some of the stealth things that maybe they were going for, but it wasn't like an awful level. There was a little bit of variety at least. Then we get another driving level and I'm actually kind of having fun with these. They're never too long and they're kind of action packed and heavily scripted and they kind of work out well. You get to use a minigun on this level too, which is always a bonus. Okay, then we're on this big freighter level and this level's kind of cool. I mean, there's a lot of shooting and whatnot, but there is a little bit of verticality where you can use your grapple hook, which I mean, it maybe is a little bit repetitive, but it does kind of play into the era of Bond where gadgets were a really big part of like Bond's arsenal. We don't see it nowadays too much in like the Daniel Craig Bonds, but if you look back when like Pierce Brosnan was Bond, there was always a lot of these little gimmicky gadgets and they were fun and them implementing here was a good use of that. Okay, then we get another little on-rail shooter level, which I mean, I don't know, why would other people be chasing us on rail here? But uh, I digress. Then we get to Poseidon, which feels very familiar. Uh, it's just another, you know, sub marine themed level kind of like the first level except uh now we're just killing harder enemies i don't know the last couple of levels are pretty straightforward they just feel like these long walking through corridors shooting enemies type levels which it feels like a lot of times bond games kind of fall into that repetition with a lot of its patterns and this game did a pretty good job at like mixing things up with some of the driving stuff but towards the end it kind of gets forced into this corner i guess there were a couple of cool things like sneaking through vents which were reminiscent to goldeneye i think a little nod there and then of course there's there's the big boss fight at the end of the story where, I don't know, it's a little goofy, it's this dude with a rocket launcher and you're just kind of there. And then there's this like huge explosion and a cutscene to wrap up the game and I have to say Bond's escape just feels very, very goofy and I kind of love it. So you know what? This game's story overall, not the worst thing in the world. It was a little campy, a little unrealistic, which whatever, that kind of was what was happening with Bond at this time anyways. It was a very okay game. It was fine. I think a lot of people probably really enjoyed the game as a kid, but as a Bond game, I don't really know if this game gives across the vibes of Bond as well as some of the other games. It feels more just like an action shooter with Bond music in it, and that's okay too, but I think this game needed to exist because the evolution of what came from ideas presented here ended up being bigger and better than what a lot of people expected. Also, there was a multiplayer in this game too, and that oftentimes when reviewers were looking at this game kind of ended up being one of the biggest redeeming qualities of Agent Under Fire to them because the game was criticized for just being like a one and done short-ish experience. A lot of the time, some of the collectibles you could go through and find were overlooked by reviewers as aspects of replay value, but the multiplayer always was something that stayed true with these first-person shooter Bond games and were important to them. So a lot of people were willing to kind of give the game a pass because at least they had the multiplayer that was heavily inspired by Goldeneye. And for whatever reason, this game was also toted as being a return to the roots from what The World Is Not Enough was, which is weird to me because I feel like The World Is Not Enough still felt a lot like Goldeneye, but that was just how they were trying to advertise things. They always were leaning on Goldeneye's success to try to promote the next thing, and I always thought that was kind of a weird choice to make sometimes. But yeah, this game existed. Everything changed, though, in 2002 when the game Nightfire finally released, which was essentially built off of what was already done with Agent Underfire. Bond was turning into a yearly release at this point. Now, what's really interesting to me is that Nightfire releasing in 2002, in my opinion, after playing through all of these games, was by far one of the most impressive Bond games in the series. I think like they really were just firing on all cylinders here, and you wouldn't expect a game like this to work with a very short development time and multiple developing studios 
studios being brought on by EA to work together to get this game done within a short deadline. But nonetheless, Nightfire would release, and man, I loved this game as a kid. This time around, the game fully embraces Pierce Brosnan as the Bond of the era. He's even on the box itself, not like, you know, silhouetted as before. Development on this game had one team focusing just on like the first person's perspective levels, trying to make the game feel tighter and different, while another team was focused on doing the vehicle-based missions. There was way more money and budget put into the cinematics of this game, so there was a lot less awkward moments like we saw in Agent Under Fire. And this game follows James Bond himself facing off against the antagonist Raphael Drake, who essentially has been secretly working on this huge space project that will de-arm nuclear weapons and redraw country lines, allowing Drake to have leverage in taking over certain corporations that have global control and, you know, typical villain stuff. Bond has to stop him. Okay, Nightfire opens up in this action-packed sniper mission where you're in a helicopter trying to stop this other agent, Dominique, from getting chased by these bad guys, so you have to stop essentially a terrorist attack that's also going on. I don't know, a lot's going on here, I don't care, I'm just in the mode. We shoot some tires, we shoot some cars, we cause some explosions, there's a lot of explosions in this first level. Then next thing you know, you're behind the wheel of a car, and you're driving, just like Bond, through the streets of Paris dodging left and right and using different gadgets in your vehicle to keep the enemies at bay. Ultimately, we make the escape and Bond does, you know, his, his Bond thing. This is more just like an action-backed prologue. It doesn't really have too much to do with, like, anything else. I mean, it introduces some characters, but nonetheless, it was just a cool intro. The real story, though, begins in the next level. The Exchange is such a cool level. It's this snowy castle where there's this, like, big party of wealthy individuals that our antagonist, Drake, is hosting. And you have to sneak in. Now, there's different ways you can sneak in, which is a really cool idea, like you can use this truck or sneak around the sides of the cliff, tactically choosing who you fight and who you don't. And when he gets inside the base, he runs into not only Dominique from, you know, the night before, but also this random girl, Zoe Nightshade. Uh, yeah, she's the character from Agent Under Fire, you know, that first level, that girl you had to save, uh, and she appears a couple other times. Yeah, she's just randomly here for a few levels. She doesn't stay long, but, uh, yeah, she's, she's here for whatever reason. Nonetheless, Bond's here for a mission. There's, like, some secret meeting going on with information about the Nightfire thing, and some microchip that Bond is able to sneak into by you know, taking care of some guards, and uh, he gets to witness this secret meeting. But with all the information he needs, I guess he people recognize him or something, so like, all hell breaks loose, there's gunfire and stuff. Bond does manage to make his escape on this very shady looking cable car, and uh, this helicopter comes and attacks, but he just happens to have a good old fashioned remote controlled rocket launcher, which he uses to shoot down the helicopter. From there, Bond and Zoe Nightshade, who's randomly here again, make their escape on this snowmobile car thing, which is kind of cool. Bond has to like shoot a bunch of machine guns while Zoe drives, and then eventually they get to their own car, their nice Aston Martin V12, and we get another little driving level, which is a little more challenging than the first one, but still really well done. There's even this like boss fight where you're running out of time and you have to quickly take out all the helicopters and enemies and you're limited on ammo. Kind of a cool little thing that they did here. The next level, Bond has to go like protect some guy and get information about the Nightfire weapon or Phoenix weapon, whatever it's called. And we get to go to this like really cool like traditional Japanese styled home and we have to keep this guy safe. We also have to protect like these random servants that he has. I mean, he calls them that, not me. He also wants us to make sure we destroy his hard drive just in case anything happens, so we do that too. And it was at this point in the game, I realized that the, once again, just like Agent Under Fire, the visuals here are very impressive for 2002 standards. Actually, a big step up from the previous game. I mean, once again, the little details on this level alone are exceptional for 2002 standards. We run all his little errands for him, and as we're escaping with him in hand, we tell the dude to stay back, he doesn't listen, a ninja attacks him, of course. So now we have to fight the ninja. As a kid, I never could beat him. He was like the strongest enemy ever. As an adult, he wasn't that hard to beat at all. After we complete this section, we go to Mayhew, who's bleeding out or whatever, and he tells us that he doesn't even have the information we needed on him anyways, but he tells us where we can go find it in this tower somewhere. We're just gonna have to go infiltrate that. Thanks a lot, man. We did all this for nothing. And just as he dies, his bodyguard 
comes up and is like, oh no, we'll work together and make them pay. Okay, so now we're in this huge skyscraper building and this level is kind of like what they tried to do with Agent Under Fire with a stealth mission, but done correctly. And it's really cool. It's this huge tower. You have to make your way up multiple floors, getting access to areas that you're not supposed to have access to using tranquilizer darts because these are technically civilians. So if you accidentally kill someone, it's game over here. And you have to successfully get the information that you need. He ends up getting ambushed though while he's on the top floor. So Bond makes an escape with a parachute, which is pretty badass. And the information that he got from those computers ends up sending Bond to this decommissioned missioned nuclear power plant. This level was really challenging. It's kind of the sniper level, but you're like having to look out for other snipers and maneuver around. There hadn't been a level like this yet, and I think that this was kind of the perfect time to do it. Right after a stealth mission where we couldn't use lethal action, this is kind of a stealth mission where you can, and there's some exciting back and forth moments. And once again, I just want to highlight that this game does a really good job at keeping the gameplay feel varied, where Agent Under Fire kind of lacked and things were repetitive. This one seems to kind of be executing a lot of these ideas and moving things along. Anyways, Bond figures out that stuff's going on here and he runs into Kiko, that security guard from earlier, and they make their big escape together. But then it turns out Kiko was working for Drake and she tranquilizes Bond and takes him back to that tower he parachuted off of earlier. There we see some big reveal that Dominique, who was that secret agent from earlier, was undercover this whole time with this Drake dude, but he figured it out all along and he was like, I fell for you. Now it's time you fall for me. And, uh, Kiko straight up just throws her off the building. Oh my God. But with all of the commotion, Bond is able to escape barely breaking through the elevator and he has to fight his way uh, down the building that he came up earlier, but this time he can shoot everything. And when he gets to the bottom and it looks like there's no way out, boom, through the window, Zoe Nightshade ready to save Bond, except it's not actually Zoe Nightshade. You think like since they introduced Zoe Nightshade earlier, she would be the character that comes and gets him here, but no, it's a brand new character. Allura McCall, who's like an Australian agent, and uh, she's like the new Bond girl to replace the one that, uh, you know, flew off the building. Okay, a lot happens after this. They go into this underwater car to reach Drake's private island. The next level was this interesting hybrid of a driving and flying on rail shooter level. This one was really hard for whatever reason. And at this point in the story, it definitely seems like things are much more imminent than maybe what anyone thought because uh, they're getting ready to straight up go to space to get this night fire thing going, this Phoenix thing that's gonna do all the stuff the bad guy wants to do. So Bond has to go and pursue Drake before, you know, all this happens. Bond makes it to like the launch facility and all of these rockets are starting to go off. Essentially as a player, you're faced with like a really challenging battle against several ninjas who are coming out to attack you and other security guards that are coming wave after wave while these missiles are launching and you have to quickly get behind these blast doors or you'll die. It's actually a pretty challenging mechanic and a little bit stressful because you want to keep moving, but also, you know, you don't want to get stuck outside before the blast doors close. After all that though, Bond manages to maneuver into the last rocket up into space and Kiko finds herself on the wrong side of those blast doors. That's karma. So then Bond goes to outer space. Yes, we are playing as James Bond straight up in outer space. We get this cool laser gun and essentially we have to go to these different panels that open up and shoot them to stop the thing from going off and then eventually Drake will show up and it's this big epic boss fight that was actually kind of challenging surprisingly. I mean I know we're getting used to this whole like space mechanics but it was hard. But if you could kill Drake you officially beat the game and the day was saved by Bond. And man, what a cool finale. Like this actually felt like things were bubbling up to this big moment. And while maybe going to outer space was a little bit over the top, it kind of worked here. I think the fact that this game kept things a bit more grounded and realistic than Agent Under Fire, but also had a lot of varied gameplay and some interesting cinematics. It really played well for Nightfire feeling like a full fleshed out experience where you had these varied moments and different ways you could approach scenarios, which kept the game feeling fresh and interactive. I don't know. This game was just awesome through and through. Had a good story, but also the multiplayer low key really slapped. And uh, I think that also helped this game continue to be successful. In these newer games, they had introduced AI for 
multiplayer, which was really cool if you were just playing by yourself, but you still wanted to like do a different experience than playing through the story. And while this game had multiple different releases being released on the PS2, Xbox, GameCube, and PlayStation, and there was a Game Boy Advance version as well. And while not all of the games had all of the same features and flow that Nightfire had like on the PS2 version, for example, this game was still solid across the board. Even though the PC versions often looked at as like the weakest version of all these releases, the multiplayer ended up still being pretty successful and there's still communities that get together and play this game online together. So I think that's a big testament to the success that this game was. I also want to bring up because we haven't talked about Game Boy games in a little bit. There were a few Game Boy Bond games that released through the previous couple of games that we've talked about. There was James Bond 007, which came out after GoldenEye. And as a kid, I never knew what I was supposed to do in this game. I did buy it from a used game store, trading in a few of my Pokemon games. Why did I do that? But yeah, this was like a puzzle game where you walked around and tried to solve stuff. There was The World Is Not Enough, which was essentially an adaptation of the game and movie, but from like this top-down perspective. I mean, I think they got a lot of the set pieces to work here with the Game Boy Color. It's kind of nice. This game was really hard. I think a lot of people felt like this game was way too difficult to figure out how to get past. Even if you look at the comments, you'll see people complaining about how hard the game was for them back in the day, not knowing what to do. And then there was Nightfire, which right here is actually really interesting. It's for the Game Boy Advance, but it's a first-person shooter on the Game Boy Advance, and that's very uncommon. I gotta give them some credit here. They followed the story of Nightfire, and the locations are very much Nightfire locations, though uh, obviously there's not as much like varied gameplay, but there is something here. It doesn't hold up well today, but... It if this was 2002 and I had a Game Boy Advance, I'd be kind of impressed with what this was. Okay, there's also a bunch of mobile games that released when the rise of mobile games became a thing. A lot of them were really low quality cash grabs that were overpriced, so we're not really gonna go into them too much, but they are worth at least mentioning, especially whenever like a movie was coming out, they'd throw something out there to try to make some money. But these weren't like the big budget Bond games or these like little spin-off handheld games. These were something kind of worse, so we're going to focus more in on everything else. But there still was one more Pierce Brosnan inspired Bond game that would release with a completely unique story. And we had the game Everything or Nothing, which released in 2004, two years after Die Another Day released. And oh boy, what a game this was. This game departed from the typical first person shooter experience that we were used to and reverted back to what we saw from Tomorrow Never Dies, which definitely was a daring decision to say the least. And this game was a little bit opposite of what you would maybe expect. Now this game does have an original story once again, though it draws a lot of elements from other movies like Jaws shows up. And you know what? This game was, I don't know. I prefer the first person shooter experience when it comes to Bond games. And this one going the third person perspective was a pretty dramatic change, but it wasn't nearly as bad as what we saw with Tomorrow Never Dies. Matter of fact, this game was praised for actually being a pretty good experience all around, which I think at its time, the game was rightfully so praised. However, looking back now, maybe this game wasn't as cutting edge as, you know, what we thought it was back then. This is definitely one of the longer James Bond games by far, though. So there's quite a bit to cover, so we're gonna actually kind of go through this pretty quickly here. The first mission has you, like, out in a regular James Bond type operation. This serves a little bit as a tutorial that then ties into like MI6 training, which is in this weird black and green type room. And in this game, the whole premise of the story is stopping this villain, Nikolai Diavolo, who wants to use nanotechnology to control the world's armies. It's up to Bond to save the day. I don't know, we go to Egypt or there's some big explosions. You kind of run around in circles, hoping the camera catches up to you when it can. We then go into this train sequence, which hold up. Driving this motorcycle as James Bond actually feels really good, like really, really badass. Also, I don't know if it's just me, but I feel like the visual clarity of this game has maybe gone down a notch. Like, the landscapes and designs aren't as polished as the last two Bond games, but maybe that's just me. Maybe some places will look better. We get on the train, we have a somewhat of a stealth mission, I guess, and then we have to fight Jaws? Uh, hello there. Um, wasn't expecting him to be here since it had been, like, a couple of decades, but nonetheless, we fight Jaws, and, uh, then we make our escape. Anyways, there's some scientists on this train that we gotta go and save, and, uh, she's upset because the general's getting away with the nano robot. The general is getting away with the nano robots. Honestly, Bond's performance isn't that much better either. I think we may be reaching the end of the line here. 
play the line where he's like, I think we're reaching the end of the line here. Fortunately enough though, this Bond flies a helicopter and we get in the helicopter for a cutscene and Wait, we're playing in the helicopter? Okay, we're now flying a helicopter. This is new. Anyways, we fly through this thing. We do our thing. We save the day and Bond has a little interest here. But wait, there's a twist. She's not who she says she is. She uh, might be uh, in cahoots with the villain. Okay, for how much I might criticize, you know, little things like the design not looking as good. This game did have quite a bit of charm in some of these cutscenes, even if the line deliveries were weird. Like there was a lot of like little in-between things to build up narrative and stories. Like I like the interactions with Bond and M or when we go see Q and what's going on over there. We're thrown into another driving mission, which goes about the way you would expect a driving mission in a Bond game to go. Okay, next thing we know, we're in like this temple area. There's these weird train tracks all over the place, which honestly, I'm not buying it. I feel like these are pretty unrealistic. And actually the whole layout here doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. Um, but yeah, we you wander around, you kill the enemies, you do stuff. Things heat up though later on when we get into the turret of a tank, which is cool. We get to shoot this machine gun. Finally, we get to do more driving on that motorcycle. Let's go. All right, after that, we get another driving level. Okay. Then there's this really short level that's like inside of a club. Uh, all right. Is anyone else getting like Grand Theft Auto vibes somewhere around this point? Or is that just me, maybe? All right, another driving level through some tunnels. And then we get to use a gadget where we control it through a bunch of narrow corridors, I guess. All right, we finally have a stealth mission where we have to, like, sneak around a building and, you know, stealthily do things. And it's okay. It's not nearly as fun as, like, what we had in Nightfire. And it's competent enough. But, man, I feel like the pacing in this game is really all over the place. The gunplay doesn't feel good. And the stealth kind of works when the camera wants it to. But then, at the same time, the best parts of these games are the driving levels and I don't know if that's a testament to how fun they've made the driving levels back in the day or if just the other part of the gameplay was really starting to fall flat at this point but I mean honestly what looks more fun this or this next driving level where we're in a motorcycle on a highway just cruising downtown it's funny because after this then we're in a race car actually just racing like <laughs> Just sidetracking from the actual Bond experience. Okay, then we get the stereotypical, your base is under attack, you have to defend it, Bond, storyline. Followed by another car chase scene, again. Man, this game really at least has decent car play going on because this would get really tedious quickly if this part wasn't at least really fun. Okay, as we get into the second half of the game here, things do get at least interesting as the story starts to kind of bubble up. There are some interesting scenarios Bond finds himself in and you have to like escape or, you know, shoot more enemies. There's a lot more running through until we're faced off with our final big boss. A, a hover jet. <laughs> what? This is like, I don't know. I mean, yes, it's a finale, but it's just not that exciting. I mean, we were in space last time and now we're just here doing this. Bond, of course, wins here at the end and everyone's happy, I guess. I know I really just scrolled through this one quickly. What, what do you expect? We, we do fight Jaws a couple more times through the playthrough of the game, but like outside of that, it wasn't anything too substantial. I think for 2004 standards, this game was probably really fun. I think a lot of people could have really enjoyed it. However, it's also very obvious this game is drawing a lot of inspiration from games like Grand Theft Auto and very much so Splinter Cell. And Splinter Cell kind of evolved into a really solid series before Ubisoft abandoned it. So this feels like something trying to emulate the older Splinter Cell games, which is fair for its time, but it just doesn't hold up as strongly as maybe I would have liked it to. I do think parts of the story are interesting, but the voice acting delivery... <laughs> it's it's fun. It's funny fun, but not like polished perfection fun. They did do a few interesting things though that definitely deserve credit though. Like they had cooperative missions and any game that has cooperative play automatically, no matter how bad the game is, gets like a little point in my book because too many games just abandon co-op. So I don't know. What else? There was a skydiving part that was kind of cool where you were free falling. All right. Okay. So the next game in the Bond series was actually a spinoff, but it also was a sequel. EA just couldn't let GoldenEye go with how successful that game had been without them getting a chunk of that change. So they decided to make a sequel game called GoldenEye Rogue Agent, or at least the game was originally planned as a sequel before it branched out into a spin-off game. I remember since I was such a fan of GoldenEye when I was really young, when this game released, I was so excited to have a follow-up remake game or something like that. I didn't know what it was, but I was excited for it. And I'll be honest, 
I was crushed as a kid when I got this game and played it for a few hours to realize it was nothing at all what I had expected. This game you don't play as Bond, you play as some other agent who essentially has a golden eye. That's the connection to golden eye. Has nothing to do with like the satellite golden eye thing from the movie, it's just its own separate thing. Okay, where do we begin with this? James Bond dies in this one. I mean, not really, it's like a simulation, but it ends up getting the guy like disavowed from MI6, so he goes rogue to do his own thing. I was so utterly crushed and disappointed by this game, and to this day, it's always just kind of like left a bad negative taste in my mouth, and I just don't like this game. So I decided to make Luke take a closer look at it, cause, uh, you know, he can look at a Bond game. Let's give him GoldenEye Rogue Agent. I kind of knew about Elijah's bias towards this game, but I've also kind of seen him play Rainbow Six Siege. So let's see what this game is also about. This game is actually kind of interesting from the get-go because you play as a villain in the Bond universe, which that is kind of crazy and kind of very unique. What's also kind of cool is there's various older villains and characters from Bond movies that show up like Goldfinger, Dr. No, Owner Top, and those two things just on paper actually make for a pretty cool premise. But once we get to the actual game, they'll change. So what's also crazy is that this first level starts off with Bond dying in a helicopter accident. That's insane and I think this is like the first time I've ever seen Bond die really. And for the rest of the level you try to stop Goldfinger's plot to destroy all the US gold. But once the level ends, there's actually a cutscene that reveals this whole mission was like a VR training mission and M is telling you that you're dismissed because you got Bond killed. So we get fired from MI6 at the beginning of the game. So now that we're a rogue agent, we kind of get a little offer from Goldfinger himself and he offers us a job. So, you know, we take him up on that. Cause I mean, maybe he has good benefits or something, you know, and that's like kind of rare nowadays. So in the next level, Goldfinger's mountain base actually gets attacked by Dr. No and we have to defend it and fight our way out, which kind of sets up this whole plot where we start taking revenge on Dr. To know because the next level we infiltrate his skyscraper in Hong Kong. While there is a guy that's supposed to supply us with a sniper rifle, we get betrayed and then we have to fight our way through to get to the rooftop extraction point. Now after the attack on the mountain base, Goldfinger actually moved his big weapon called the Omen to his fortified vault in Las Vegas. But then Xenia Onotap on behalf of Dr. No launches an all-out assault on the casino. And it's once again up to us to defend the secret weapon and the casino. Now the next level is actually set at the Hoover Dam where Xenia Onotap establish her base and rig the whole dam with like a nuclear device. Now with Ajab's help we actually have to navigate through the complex, confront Xenia and prevent the detonation so we can actually stop the Hoover Dam from exploding. Which honestly at this point we're like trying to stop the bad guys anyway so we're like not really a villain I guess. I don't know it's kind of weird. Then in the next mission we are tasked with finding out the location of Dr. No's secret island and we have to travel to this underwater base that's utilized by like the criminal underworld called the Octopus and we have to retrieve the coordinates and then escape the octopus. Now in mission 7 the time has finally come to exact revenge on Dr. No. And you know we attack the island and we eliminate Dr. No and his forces and you know we just take them all out. We did a good job. But I guess the big boss man didn't think so because Goldfinger actually betrays us. So what do we do in mission 8? You know we seek the ultimate revenge. And while the story was kind of interesting and unique I do have to say it is not a very good James Bond game. You're just like this rogue guy and most of the gameplay or 99% of the gameplay is just you shooting yourself through waves of enemies and it gets repetitive so quickly. Also the AI isn't that good and that just also adds to the whole like repetitive feeling it just feels boring after like the second level. So overall I don't think this is a very good James Bond game. But the next game from Russia with Love actually focuses on Bond again. This game was a third person shooter that released back in 2005 for GameCube, PlayStation 2 and Xbox but also would release on the PlayStation Portable in 2006 which is actually the version I think I played back in the day even. This is the only video game that actually has young Sean Connery in it and is actually the first time Sean Connery reprised his role in 22 years and would be his eighth and final performance as Bond. The first level which is kind of the intro level takes you to London and at first you fight inside this like I think it almost looks like a palace I don't know what it, this building is actually but then there's a cool part where you get on a jetpack and you kind of fly around the Big Ben shooting at this helicopter. Now after the tutorial level is where the story really picks up and basically the organization which is called Octopus in the name but actually is supposed to be Spectra I think there was some legal issues back in the day where they couldn't call it Spectra. So it's called Octopus here. And they derived this plan to steal this encoding 
loading machine from the Soviet Union. But anyways, the second level starts off at this hatch maze in front of this mansion and we're supposed to infiltrate the mansion to get some documents. I don't think they actually say what the documents are about. So we're just like extracting these non-descriptive documents here. Then next level, we meet up with this MA6 agent in Istanbul and we kind of take his car for a test drive when all hell breaks loose. From there, we get into this car chase and then there's a little foot chase, you know, pretty standard once again. Next mission is a hostage rescue that's also in Istanbul and we get to use this like little helicopter gadget, which that's kind of cool. And then we make our escape through these tunnels, shooting our way through a bunch of enemies. And at this point, Bond is kind of asking himself, why are all these Russians attacking me? So he's gonna infiltrate the Russian embassy. Now this level actually shows a cool mechanic where you actually have an inventory and there's like a bunch of different suits. So you have to find this like Russian disguise and then you actually have to go equip it. Once we get deeper into the embassy though, we have to make our way to this underground tunnel by boat actually. And the majority of the next level is this like boat on rail shooting sequence. Once we retrieve the documents from the underground base though, we get to make our escape on a jetpack. Our information actually takes us to this gypsy camp where at first it looks like we have to solve this conflict between these two women fighting before a bunch of Russian soldiers roll up and start shooting up the place. So Bond obviously goes to defend the camp and that's what you do most of the level. The next level is called Sniper Alley and actually you do get to snipe a lot here. I think this is one again set in Istanbul. I'm not 100% sure actually. I don't think they ever specify but it looks like it. And at the end of the level you actually have to save your fellow MI6 agent and you have to snipe the guy that's holding him at gunpoint. We go back to the consulate where we have this woman waiting for us in our bed and she says her name is Tanya. Play the clip of him saying my name is James Bond. My friends call me Tanya. Mine call me James Bond. After spending the night with her, the consulate actually gets attacked in the morning and we have to defend it. And after fighting off a bunch of bad guys, we make our way to the secret underground elevator, I think, and have to make our escape through some ancient runes. And there's another jetpack part at the end of this. But Bond successfully recovers the encoding device and makes his escape. And we have to do another car chase through Istanbul again before getting on this train, where an agent of Octopus actually jumps us and takes the decoding device from us. And we fight our way through this train station in an attempt to get back the device. But all is in vain and they actually escape with the device. But we know where one of the factories is, so Bond just pulls up in a jetpack. And this is the fourth jetpack section and I gotta say it's getting a little repetitive. We fight our way through this facility which leads to another car chase which then leads to another car chase then a boat chase and then another ambush at this building. But eventually Bond makes his way to the octopus base in an attempt to retrieve the device. We fight our way through the base then there's actually two more jetpack sections in one level which at this point I don't know I don't want any more jetpack sections. But at the end of it Bond kills the big bad guy from octopus and all is good. Bond wins once again. Overall this game kind of has a charm to it, I gotta say. Even though there's some repetitive sections like the jetpack sections or the constant car chases, it just seems a little too much. They probably could have toned down those a little bit. But the fact that Sean Connery voices Bond here and you keep hearing it, it's it's very, very nice. I did read some reviews of the time and they did actually say that at the time, the gameplay did feel a little dated and so did the graphics. So I guess that's another point of criticism. And next we get to Quantum of Souls, which was the first game to feature Daniel Craig and was a first person cover shooter published by Activision. This game actually came out just a few days after the movie released, which was kind of cool because he could go see the movie in theaters and then go pick up this game just a few days later and then be disappointed by the game. But I'll get into that in a second. The first level you invade this mansion and then the Bond intro hits. So this is kind of like the prelude level that they do in all these games or most of these games. And at this point, I did immediately realize that this includes Casino Royale locations and might jump between movie locations because it says Quantum of Solace on the cover. And this mention is from Casino Royale. This mention specifically is Mr. White's estate from the first Daniel Craig Bond movie. The gameplay is fine, it's nothing too crazy but it's kind of acceptable. It feels a lot like a weaker Call of Duty campaign if that makes any sense and I do kind of enjoy running through it and kind of gunning down enemies. Now the way I was playing this game it was really laggy and it could just be the version I'm playing but it seems mostly to happen when there's scripted events. So I don't know if this would also lag back in the day when you had like the console version or whatever but I'm gonna try to edit around it or I'm gonna have to get someone else's footage because this is kind of rough to watch. Second level starts off with an attempted assassination of M and then you gotta chase the gunman across the rooftops of Siena which is from Quantum of Solace. Then the third level is from Quantum of Solace as well and it takes you to that opera house. The next level is inside a sinkhole in Bolivia which makes me think this is from Quantum of Solace but I don't think the 
this specific location shows up in the movie. The fifth level is set in the sea town of Madagascar, which is definitely from Casino Royale. Then the following level is also the same location and it's that scene where you chase the guy across the construction site and they climb up cranes and they fight and stuff. The level after that takes us to Miami, which is a location from Casino Royale once again. And the level is specifically the exterior of a science center and then the next level is the interior of the science center and the level after that is the Miami airport. So we stay in Miami for three levels in a row. But then you might think it jumps back to Quantum of Solace, but nope, we go to Montenegro and there's that train scene once again from Casino Royale. And we keep staying with Casino Royale and Le Chiffre, the main villain from the movie shows up and you spend one level chasing him and then the next level is that poison scene from Casino Royale. Very short level, you just kind of stumble around trunk. Then it's back to Montenegro and I gotta say, this game has more Casino Royale locations than anything else. Why was this called Quantum of Solids? Other than coincide with the movie release in 2008. Because even the second to last level is still a Casino Royale location and this time we're in Venice. And finally, the last level jumps back to Quantum of Solace and is set at that desert hotel that you probably remember if you have watched Quantum of Solace. Overall, the game had 15 levels and I think there were only 3 locations from Quantum of Solace and 12 from Casino Royale. That's crazy because the box clearly says Quantum of Solace and when you buy this game you definitely think this is a Quantum of Solace game, but it's actually mostly Casino Royale game. Besides that, the game itself isn't terrible, it just gets really repetitive real quick and it turns into mindless shooting almost every level. There are like these hacking sequences, but they don't happen too often and they don't really provide any challenge. I mean, I thought they were kind of easy. So it's kind of a very middle of the road game. We move forward into the next generation of consoles into the Wii era and Activision actually got the rights to the Bond franchise. So moving forward, EA was done and Activision was taking over and Activision's had a unique plan. How can they capitalize on Goldeneye? Okay, so I guess Activision now wanted a cut of Goldeneye's success from a little over 10 years earlier, but there were confusion with the rights to how Goldeneye would work because Rareware retained some level of rights since they designed the game and that was now owned by Xbox. Activision had the rights to the gaming publishing of Bond and then they'd also have to get approval by Nintendo if they wanted to like remake Goldeneye. There was actually this whole build that Rare and Xbox was working on a remake of Goldeneye that never saw the light of day because of these issues in legality. It's actually really interesting and it's one we'll talk about a little bit later. It's like a fully done remake that never saw a full release. So Activision decided to walk the line of how close can we get to making a GoldenEye game without, you know, copying the GoldenEye game. And I feel like this is also kind of like some sketchy line of game development or planning. I mean, in a way, it felt like they straight up were trying to like convince the consumer that this was a GoldenEye remake. And in a way, it kind of is. Okay, so GoldenEye 007 for the Wii, published by Activision, but still developed by uh, the same development studio, Eurocom, who had worked on previous Bond games. They just never worked on GoldenEye. Essentially is a recreation of the film GoldenEye, starring Pierce Brosnan, except retold as if it was a new story from the ground up, starring Daniel Craig, who was the current Bond at the time. This premise alone, always weirded me out. Even more so, it's very obvious that they wanted to essentially tell a completely unique Bond story, but obviously they wanted the GoldenEye marketing, so it's like they went through the movie of GoldenEye and someone like wrote down the main bullet points of the plot and story and characters into a notebook and then handed it off to someone who had never seen the movie and they developed the game. And that is definitely the way that this feels. All of the set locations and levels in this game beginning to end are completely redesigned and original. They are not at all inspired by the movie or the original GoldenEye game, anything like that. It still opens up with a truck and a dam, but the dam looks very different. You still go into the factory and it's a different looking factory. 006 looks like this now, which, okay. And just overall, it's way more modern. There's a couple of extra sequences added in. And honestly, this feels not very much like GoldenEye at all. I mean, you'd be like, oh yeah, this is how they interpreted this section of the story, I guess. Now, that criticism, which I do think it is a criticism at the end of the day, because why didn't they just do an original game at this point? And we, we put that criticism aside. In itself, this game isn't actually all that bad. For a Wii game, this is actually a very good, high-quality 
game by 2010 Wii standards. It's very heavily inspired by Call of Duty, which makes sense, this is Activision, but it feels like a unique Call of Duty game on the Wii, for better or worse, I guess. I think anybody who picked this game up back in the day and wanted a Bond game and they'd never really played Goldeneye probably could have really enjoyed this game because it is a good game, but anybody who bought the game thinking it was Goldeneye, which is a fair assumption to make since the game's called Goldeneye, would have been very disappointed, I think. At least I was. Nowadays, I can come around and appreciate this for the weird part of history that this game ends up being and how it is different. And still, it's one of the better Bond games that have ever released, so how mad can we really get? I mean, it's still interesting to see how they adapted the story to fit the new era with Daniel Craig. Like, it doesn't take place in the 90s, obviously, it's much more modern, and they tried to make it grittier, and they moved a lot of the plot points around a bit. Like, the big 006 reveal happens way later, which meant that they had to, like, come up with intermediate things to make the story flow a bit. But yeah, it's interesting. The game did see a re-release later on on other consoles, like the PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360 as well. And if they were to ever, like, release all of the Bond games that have ever released, you know, on modern consoles, which would be incredible, I would want to see this one included too, even with my issues that I have here. I still think it's a good game, and it's definitely a better GoldenEye than Rogue Agent, at least in my opinion. Now after playing Quantum of Solace, I was wondering what movie or movies the next Daniel Craig game, Bloodstone, would also include. Well, this is actually an original story and this is the first James Bond game since Everything or Nothing to feature an original story. It's set between Quantum of Solace and Skyfall and released in 2010, two years before Skyfall would actually come out. The story centers around Bond teaming up with a fellow MI6 agent named Nicole Hunter to destroy a global conspiracy involving a biochemical weapon. Now right away I realized that this isn't another first person shooter game, this is actually a third person shooter shooter, similar to Uncharted or Gears of War. But I think this game also heavily borrows from like Splinter Cell with its stealth mechanics and stuff, which isn't usually my cup of tea, but we'll see how the game is. Now the first level takes you to Athens, Greece, and is super action-packed. You land on a yacht via a parachute, then go on a boat chase, then after a light foot chase, there's a car chase as well. And that's all within like 10 minutes of gameplay. Second level, you sneak around this construction site in Istanbul, and then there's a car chase at the end. Pretty standard James Bond level, if you ask me. Next, Bond infiltrates this mansion slash casino slash I don't even know what to call this building to find out more information on the biological weapon. During that he figures out that they tortured this guy to gain access to the biochemical weapon and then all hell breaks loose because of course why wouldn't it. Fourth level takes us to snowy Siberia where you kind of just walk into the science facility before having to shoot your way through to eventually blow up the whole facility. Then you chase this train by car through snow and ice and over this like frozen lake which is actually kind of a cool sequence I gotta admit. Then you get on this giant hovercraft boat thing and fight your way to the front and then you hijack an airplane which has the bioweapon on it. Also there's some talk about some paperwork. You know what kind of paperwork I would have to fill out if there were WMDs here? Clearly my mistake. Yes. Then you travel to Bangkok to tie up some loose ends and the level starts off in this aquarium before Bond gets into a rooftop chase and then there's another car chase and some more sneaking around the city area. The level does end though with Bond being captured by these terrorists. They take him to Burma where Bond makes his escape from out of this old bunker or military facility, whatever this is. And after first escaping in a plane, he gets shot down and then crashes by this dam, which is, I guess, controlled by the terrorists. But eventually he just kills the main terrorist guy and you know, that's the end of that storyline. Though there's one more level, which I forgot to mention earlier, Nicole Hunter actually betrayed Bond, and on the last level you chase her through Monaco. Pretty standard car chase level again, and Bond tries to capture her life at the end, but then this drone flies by and guns her down, so I guess Bond kind of wins at the end, I don't know. Before she dies, Nicole actually describes a man who probably would have been the antagonist of the next game, so the game kind of ends on a cliffhanger and sets up a sequel that was never released. Retroactively, there's people who speculate this, this person could have been an agent of Spectre, since that was kind of what happened with the villains from the Bond movies, but that also doesn't make any sense because Spectre didn't come out until 2015 and this game released in 2010 and there's just no way they had this much foresight. Overall I have to say the game wasn't bad, but the story was kind of generic, even though it was an original story. It was a little better than Quantum of Solace, I think, but overall it was just nothing too great. The gameplay felt fine and the action was kind of cool sometimes. It's not terrible, but it's not like something amazing. In 2012, it was the 50th anniversary for the James Bond franchise, and to celebrate that, they released the game 007 Legends, which was a first-person shooter released on PC, PlayStation 3, Xbox 360, and the Wii U. In the game, there was five missions from the 23 Bond movies at the time, plus later on there was one more DLC level released. The first level is based on the movie Goldfinger, and you take on the 
role of James Bond as he infiltrates Goldfinger's Fort Knox facility to stop his plan of him irradiating the gold supply of the United States. Second level is based on Her Majesty's Secret Service and Bond must navigate the snowy mountain in Switzerland to stop the release of this biological weapon that's like a deadly virus or something. Third level is from License to Kill and in this level you seek revenge for the murder of like your close friend. And this level is actually based in various locations and there's a lot of action going on in this level. And then at the end you obviously go get the big bad guy. Then the next level is from Die Another Day where Bond must survive a North Korean military base while investigating the origins of a satellite weapon that could trigger a global conflict, you know, normal James Bond stuff. This level is kind of stealth heavy and it got a lot of combat sequences which is kind of cool. I think Die Another Day wasn't as highly rated but I think the movie is very popular, mostly because Haley Berry or Hallelujah. The next level is based on Moonraker where Bond travels to space and you prevent this plan that the bad guy has to kind of exterminate humanity and repopulate the earth with a genetical superior race which is crazy. Now since 07 Legends released before Skyfall release they would eventually do a free DLC for Skyfall. Now the Skyfall part opens up with that chase through Istanbul where Daniel Craig chases one guy and they end up on a train and Daniel Craig gets shot and then the second part takes place in Shanghai where then he gets his revenge on the guy and ends up killing him. It's pretty short I'd say like 20 minutes long which is kind of weird but I mean it was a free DLC so what can you expect. Also from what I can tell it's pretty hard to actually get this DLC nowadays since it didn't come on the disc and the download for it is kind of gone. While it is kind of cool to go through all these set pieces from the Bond movies I do have to say the game is incredibly short and also the gameplay is nothing too special but I do have to say they did still put in like some variety with like some stealth sections and stuff like that. So it's not all bad I think if you're a pretty big James Bond film and you like generally all the movies this one is probably pretty good for like a hardcore fan. Though some of the choices for levels and set pieces are questionable. Also there was some harsh criticism because Daniel Craig is definitely like on the forefront as the Bond here and also like he isn't even voiced by himself so it's kind of this weird mix of constantly seeing Daniel Craig in these old settings and then not really hearing Daniel Craig. So this mostly brings us up to modern day when it comes to the Bond series and we haven't had a game in over 10 years which is crazy to think about but there is something coming up soon. Right, Luke? Right, there is the IO Interactive James Bond 007 working title, I guess, coming up. So so, so what is that exactly? I don't know. We don't know much information about it. They just announced they're working on a James Bond game. It's the people that made the Hitman reboot series, like Hitman 2016, Hitman 2, Hitman 3. And I'm a very big fan of those games, so I am very excited for these for this James Bond project to finally come out and to be more shown. I feel like the Hitman sandbox would work really well in a Bond setting. Almost more than a Hitman setting, now that I think about it. It would, like, they could they could do some crazy stuff. And I mean, they did, the only thing we do know is that it'll be an original Bond story. So it'll be its own thing. I kind of like that better, I think, at this point, since we don't even know what the future has for Bond movies right now. That's, that's true, yeah, we don't even know who the next Bond is. So yeah, I think this is a very exciting project, and I hope this doesn't get, like, development held uh, uh, and back. Yeah, and I hope it's also not bad. Like... Imagine all this weight and hype and it just ends up being terrible. True. And I do have to say like Hitman 2 was the peak and the Hitman 3 was a little weaker. I still enjoyed it a lot, but they definitely didn't push Hitman 3 as much as I feel like they could have. Maybe they were just kind of like running out of ideas in a shorter time frame. Maybe, maybe. But like there was like, you know, there was short uh, or like there was less levels. There was less like mission stories. There was less like, or there was like no DLC missions and stuff. You know what I mean? They kind of ran out of steam. I think there's a lot of opportunities of things to do with Bond. Yeah, for sure, for sure. I hope they do have driving levels, though, even if that might not be, like, right up IO Interactive's, like, wheelhouse with how they did Hitman. But I feel like, from what we played, having that pacing to break up some things did kind of seem cool every once in a while. And I feel like they, they have a great formula with Hitman already, but they could also do even more. Maybe. Hopefully. And I mean, oh, I also want to clarify, when I said earlier they made, like, the Hitman reboot, they also made the other Hitman games. But I think the Hitman reboots are, like, the best work. Right, right. I agree. That's what I just assumed you meant. Now, that doesn't end the Bond in video games arc just yet, because there are a ton of games that ended up getting cancelled that I want to talk about, but there's also some really cool fan projects that are just worth mentioning here, too. There's, like, GoldenEye Source, which a lot of people already know what that is. It was, like, a remake that had been in development for a long time to just kind of recreate the multiplayer experience of GoldenEye, but in Source. There's a couple other projects out there, fan projects, that 
have come and gone and some that are still allegedly in development to bring Goldeneye back in a truer form. But what I actually think is one of the cooler modding communities is the community that's been working on Goldeneye itself, the original N64 version. And the modding community has really grown over the last couple of years over there to the point where there are a handful of essentially ROM hacks of Goldeneye just converting the game into a brand new story and a brand new, a lot of the times adapted off of a different Bond movie. So there's like Tomorrow Never Dies on N64. There's some older Bond movies adapted onto the N64 all using the Goldeneye engine. And I think that's really cool just to have these other stories just kind of able to be played with Goldeneye, which was already a solid game. Yeah, that actually sounds sick. Yeah, maybe I check one of those out, especially if there's a Pierce Brosnan one. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think there's those. There's some even older ones, but I think there's also uh, some of them can even run on the original hardware if you have like one of those flash carts or whatever. Uh, so I always thought that's impressive, but even for like emulation, it's cool that that exists. Now, I feel like a lot of you guys are going to be really surprised with how many canceled James Bond games have existed over the years. It's not just like a couple. There's quite a few that have been either announced or leaked that just never came into fruition. So we're going to have to go all the way back to the 80s again. These old Bond games that, you know, already looked, you know, kind of a uh, rough, rough, rough's a really good way to put it. There was supposed to be the game Octopussy adapted from the movie into one of these older Bond forms all the way back in 1983, apparently. That's a long time ago. It's like 40 years ago. Yeah, it was supposed to come out that summer and it never released. Nobody knows why, but there are two screenshots of what that game would have looked like. And that's all we have. Moving forward into the 90s, there was another GoldenEye game that was being developed, but for the Virtual Boy. And that was a racing game that would have been released solely exclusively on the Nintendo Virtual Boy. But um, we all know how the Virtual Boy ended up. Little little VR hype back in the 90s. It was VR before VR was VR. We do have a screenshot of what the racing game would have looked like, but other than that, uh, this this thing never released. And it's probably because the, the Virtual Boy wasn't that successful. Okay, then the game The Spy Who Loved Me, which had already released on quite a few different consoles back in the day. In the 90s, when that game finally was like seeing more releases onto actual consoles, there were some talks to apparently bring that game also onto the PlayStation, but because Tomorrow Never Dies was already in development, this project just fell through. And then of course, there's the one we briefly mentioned earlier on in the video, but with Tomorrow Never Dies, that game apparently was originally supposed to be a sequel for the movie Tomorrow Never Dies and not its own game. So at some point, there was a build of this game that was developed as a sequel to the movie and in the VHS release of Tomorrow Never Dies there was actually a commercial for it. It was called Tomorrow Never Dies The Mission Continues and the trailer even had Desmond Llewellyn in it and uh he was kind of showing off all of the parts of the game. It's this weird PSA type styled thing but yeah it's interesting that they went through the budget and the process of filming all this for a game that never was going to come out that never would come out. Now what's interesting, Luke, is on this one, all the sources I've seen, and I don't know how accurate this can be, but all the sources that I've seen suggested that the reason they changed the game's focus was because of focus groups. Like they got people in to play the game, I guess, and then the feedback made them want to change the whole story of the game. Yeah, that sounds pretty bad. I wonder what like, you know, what they didn't like. How bad could it have been? Especially if, the, cause this caused like a major delay for the game release that they had to rework a lot of stuff. So I do wonder, you know, what happened there? What's this original version that like everybody hated apparently? Yeah, I, do, I feel like there's builds out there. It has to be. I don't know if this has been reported on as lost media, but I definitely feel like the fact that we could even see what the menu looks like and that there was a logo that said the mission continues, all of that. It just makes me feel like there's definitely a build out there somewhere of this game that it'd be interesting to see how it plays and how different things ended up being because we know a lot of these games were built off of one intention and then later were like ported into something else. Now, um, The World Is Not Enough was another one we talked about briefly that they were doing a PS2 and PC version of the game that was going to be a separate port because The World Is Not Enough was like built by three different teams working on three different builds of the game essentially. We had the PlayStation version, the N64 version, and the Game Boy version. There was a fourth team working on PS2 and PC. That version would have had like the most advanced graphics and that never came out, which got turned into Agent Under Fire. But it is interesting that 
this was also planned for its own release based on this other movie. Apparently there was ads and screenshots that were released that showed this game with its like better resolution textures and things like that to show that they were making like a next gen version of the game. But obviously this version of the project ended up getting scrapped and down the road they kind of picked up the pieces. There was like layoffs and then Agent of the Fire came out. Okay, Luke. So you in investigated 007 Racing. Yeah. You liked it? It was okay. I mean, the cars were cool. I, I like cars and you know, Bond Hill always has cool cars. Apparently there is a PS2 sequel that was rumored to be in development. That's all we know. Interesting. That never happened, so. That's all. That's actually all we know. <laughs> and we also know Phoenix Rising was apparently a working title that was rumored to release in 2005. This one breaks my heart a bit because allegedly it started off as a sequel directly to Nightfire, which makes sense because of the Phoenix project that's in Nightfire. And um, I think this one ended up getting scrapped. Maybe just because of the distance from the Bond movies already with Pierce Bronson and not being in a Bond movie for a couple of years. That sucks because Nightfire was pretty good from, you know, I edited the part earlier and actually it looks like a banger game. Dude, it was, it was solid. And then apparently some of these elements ended up going into everything or nothing, which just seems like, you know, <laughs> what happens when a game gets canceled here. One of the most infamous uh, canceled Bond games though is definitely the GoldenEye 007 Xbox Live Arcade remake, which was essentially GoldenEye, but with much better graphics. I actually think this game would have taken the original source code and ran it through a different engine, which would allow for better textures and whatnot, but the gameplay to still feel the same. More on that in a second, but apparently this whole game was developed all the way through. It was almost ready for release. And then wasn't there a bunch of legal issues or something with like who owns the rights? There ended up being a lot of legal issues. It looked like Xbox, who owned Rare, who developed the original game, had approval from Nintendo to release this, or it's alleged that they did. That's why they greenlit development. But at the last minute, uh, Nintendo of Japan uh, changed their mind and uh, the project would not be able to release legally because they have to have all this agreements between all these other companies. It would have been interesting. It would have kind of been like how Halo Combat Evolved Anniversary lets you switch between the graphics in real time. And it would have had like multiplayer and online multiplayer, which would have been really cool. But uh, yeah, this project was uh, a no-go. Years ago, the first level leaked online and people saw it and were amazed. And then just a couple of years ago, uh, the full game ended up leaking online, so people with emulators or modern Xbox 360s are able to access the entire game. This weird deal with Nintendo needing to give approval for the game may have affected the new GoldenEye release uh, that came out like on Game Pass and Nintendo Switch Online, where it wasn't the remake version that was already done, it was just the old version ported. Probably some agreement where both versions of the game have to be the same if they wanted to release it. Wasn't the new one upscaled a little bit though, at least? Or like the new release on the Game Pass? Yeah, I think they both they they both had both the Xbox and the Switch version uh, had like the resolution upscaled or whatever. But it wasn't like um it wasn't like one version had like a full remaster to it or something. They're the same version of the game. But what's interesting is the reason I theorized that they were going to put Goldeneye into a new engine is because that's kind of what they did with Perfect Dark, which was developed by the same studio. That game ended up getting the actual remake love that we wanted it to see and i think they did that too they just took the source code and ran it through a new engine and that's why the game looked so much better without too much development work having to be put into it okay then right before electronic arts just threw away bond and didn't want to do things anymore they were allegedly working on a game adaptation for casino royale that would have had daniel craig in it however this game only was about 15 percent developed and ea decided to pull the plug on it altogether and pull the plug on bond altogether so there are like a little bit of documentations and screenshots out there of what this build of the game looked like we never actually got to see this release which would have come out on xbox 360 and ps3 and that's probably why there wasn't a bond game to release during the casino royale era and we didn't really see anything until quantum of solace a little bit later which that did have a ton of casino royale levels so i don't know right but that was done by activision instead so it, the ea side of things probably was scrapped yeah, yeah the ea side was scrapped but then they still made like 12 casino royale levels so like i don't know it's just like crazy okay then goldeneye rogue agent with ea again uh they wanted to do a sequel to that game but that game didn't do well who would have thought luke a game with a guy with a golden eye a very weird weird game that was a weird game dude i don't know okay and then you talked about this one a little bit but there was a game in production that might have been called risico which is based on like an Ian Fleming novel that is separate from everything. I don't know. It's confusing, but that could have been a follow-up to Bloodstone, which you suspected was something they were thinking about doing, but then that ended up falling through. Right. The ending of Bloodstone is like a cliffhanger kind of, and like 
you know, the, the lady that betrays you mentions someone and then she gets shot by like this aut autonomous drone. And like you never find out who shoots the drone or who the lady is, is talking about. So this game was canceled in late 2009. Uh, I, I have a theory that maybe when Activision was going through all of their stuff with uh, Call of Duty and Modern Warfare 2 developers leaving and that them having to restructure a bunch of things while Modern Warfare 3 was in development may have also exacerbated the cancellation of this game because Raven Software was behind a big part of what this Bloodstone sequel would have been. And I think uh, Activision moved Raven Software to start working on Call of Duty even more heavily than they already were at that time. So kind of had a, a little like ripple effect when uh, the whole Modern Warfare 2, 3 development fiasco happened. I'm going to change the timeline. I'm going to change the timeline. We need to go back. You need to play 007 Risico. I don't know, dude. I mean, I don't know. I think it's good that we didn't get another one. They were very generic. So out of all of these, which was your favorite game? Like, that I played or that I... Yeah, or just or just Bond game, period. I mean, GoldenEye is very good. GoldenEye is very good. I don't know, dude. GoldenEye makes me happy. I, I guess, you know, there's still a couple of games we didn't get into, unfortunately. Like, all the mobile games. I know you really wanted to talk about the mobile games. I showed some of them when you, like, mentioned it earlier in the video. And there was some really bad ones. It was, like, like a Daniel Craig one where, like, it's, like, you click your city and then there's a mission and you click drive. And then it's, like, a stock photo of some guy driving. And then, like, you, you complete the mission and you just click, 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 click. It's crazy. Some of those look really, really bad. Yeah, dude. I, I, man. But some of these old ones we couldn't even play because, like, there's, like, the Java ones and stuff. And it's really hard to find them. That's true. And uh, then there was, like, the Cypher 007 game that came out recently. And that game, I don't know. <sighs> Is it it took inspiration from Death Point and 007 Legends, and I don't even know what that means. Bond games can really be hit or miss for me. I feel like there, it's, it doesn't, it's like Halo, kind of, where it seems obvious what they need to make a good game. But then when push comes to shove, sometimes the games just aren't all that good. Uh... It depends on, like, the vision, I think, that the studio has. Right, and that's the issue, that there's so many studios that did Bond games over the years that, like, everyone wanted their own spin and their own, like, um, you know, own claim to fame when it came to Bond games, and that kind of made it so it's all over the place. Too many cooks in the kitchen. I guess so. Oh, one thing, I'd I would really like to play the GoldenEye remake, like, the one that's fully done. We should figure out how to get that, like, uh, if it's, if we can get it somehow. That'd be, that'd be cool to play. I think uh, there's just, like, little things there that, that would be interesting. I think there's, like, even, like, textures that only show up in, like, a hacked version or something. There's, like, some weird mysteries with, with GoldenEye 2 that I'd like to look into as well. Remember when we had our Perfect Dark mystery video? Dude, that was back in the Halo days. We did a whole video on this one mystery Perfect Dark. It was, like, a question mark up in the crates. That was a good video. That video didn't get very many views, did it? Sure, but I still enjoyed the video. Wait, how many views does it have now? You yeah, know, I loved making that video. Let's see, Rocket Sloth... Perfect dark. 33k? 33k, yeah. Yeah, it was back in the old days, dude. I mean, that's not that bad, actually, on views. Compared to some of the Halo stuff we did, I guess it did okay. The Nintenduary. When are we doing Nintenduary again? Yeah, I don't know, dude. Next year. February's already over. Damn, shucks. Dang. We gotta we get ahead on it and start it now. We're doing what? We're gonna get ahead on it and start it now. Oh, ahead, okay. What did you think I said? I don't know. Some other thing. I don't know how I feel about that. Uh, guys, thanks so much for watching. I hope you guys uh, enjoyed this video. If you guys played any Bond games back in the day, if you disagree with our opinion on any of the Bond games, let us know in the comments. I'd like to hear you guys' feedback at the very least and see what we're wrong about. Make sure you guys are subscribed if you're new. Also, if you want to be a patron, here's a list of some of our cool patrons who have hung out with us and supported our channels. Uh, so that's a thing too. But uh, otherwise, we'll see you guys all next time with a new video. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.